Welcome to Babel and Done, a podcast created by Premier in partnership with Archbishop Joseph D'Souza and the Good Shepherd Church of India. Bishop D'Souza is a renowned Christian intellectual and civil rights activist from India who leads the Good Shepherd Movement and the All India Christian Council. And I'm Johnny Moore, an American evangelical who serves as the president of the Congress of Christian Leaders and JDA Worldwide. We live in an interconnected world where the questions are complex. So on every episode of Babel Undone, Bishop D'Souza and I aim to bring the global church together in conversation about an important issue facing everyone. And we do it from different perspectives. Bishop comes from the East and I come from the West. So naturally, we meet in London. Um, So Bishop, what's our conversation about today? How uh, Christians in Ukraine and from outside Ukraine are saving lives. You know, the world has watched with horror as the Russian, Russia's war with Ukraine has raged down, flattening whole towns, killing hundreds of thousands, causing effects on the lives of all of us wherever we live in the world. Yet, like usual, while many are focused on the politics of war, you can once again find the global church on the front lines of saving, front lines of saving lives. Today we'll tell a different story about what's happening in Ukraine with the story of how the country's churches have become centers for humanitarian assistance, saving lives every day. And joining us uh, for, for this conversation uh, is, is a European uh, Christian leader born in Sweden uh, before uh, moving to Africa uh, to serve uh, and God has taken him back uh, to serve in his own continent uh, of of Europe. Um, first in the Syrian refugee crisis, uh, helping Syrians and Afghans that were going to his native country of Sweden, uh, and now um, leading some of the first and certainly most effective response through local churches, helping people in need, helping those affected by the war in Ukraine. He's a European author, pastor, and humanitarian leader, the executive director of CityServe International. Here is Carl Hargistam. Now, we know you, but not everyone knows your story. So if, if a Christian in North or South America, Africa, Europe, Asia, asked you, who is Carl Hargistam? What would you tell them as your story? <laughs> Thank you. Well, Carl Hargistam, I'm born uh, in the kingdom of Sweden. I'm born in Sweden actually in North Sweden, which would be close to the Arctic Circle, very different from most of my life. But as I got to know Jesus as my personal savior, and the, even uh, the discovery that I felt he had an assignment for my life that took me to Africa first, 88 was my first, and I was very young then, but um, Tanzania, East Africa, in a wider region included um, Rwanda, the genocide in 94, um, you know, that brought me eventually to America, and I met my wife in California. We together lived in Ethiopia for 18 years and been serving most in poor countries, obviously. Um, but, you know, our work has been with churches believing that uh, um, the gospel should be for everybody. In fact, our mission statement is one chance for every person, meaning the idea that uh, birthrights, we talk about human rights, rights to water, to school, to many things, but the right to hear the gospel and at least once have an opportunity to respond to it. That's been our life mission, and that's what we like to be known as and for. Wonderful. So, uh, Carl, you, you've um, been on the front lines uh, with CityServe of interacting with the, the church in Ukraine uh, in in light of this terrible, terrible war uh, that the whole world has been, been watching. Uh, and we want to talk to you about that um, in just a second, because you've seen what people haven't seen. You've experienced what people haven't experienced. These are stories of the church that need to be known and that need to be told for, for generations. But first, why don't you step back before uh, Russia invaded Ukraine and, and give us a sense of um, who is the, the church in Ukraine? You know, t- tell us about what was going on uh, among, among Christians uh, in, in the church in Ukraine before the war. Excellent. Uh, yeah, this is a great question. I, you know, the Eastern European uh, churches, as we all know, Europe has over decades drifted more secular, and, and uh, Christianity has been having a, uh, you know, been less effective. A lot of the churches uh, across that, but the Eastern European churches, and in particular the Ukrainian church, 
has had some significant response to the gospel. Of course, you know, their Christian history is deep, thousand years old. You know, they had the first real mass baptism uh, there with King Oleg he came from the Ottoman Empire. Had In fact, Constantinople and decided this is where heaven meets earth and, and, and led a lot of people to the Lord. So they, the heritage is there. But recently, the last, uh, you know, the, the recent churches, the last really 30, 40 years, the, the real significant revivals we feel in Europe has been uh, in Ukraine, and the Ukraine has been vibrant, uh, and and uh, so there have been some significant things. But that's also included, I think, Moldova and several surrounding countries. We've seen some great gospel work done by the churches. So we've always been looking at that, and which is uh, interesting, I think, in such a time as this, when the conflict began. Obviously, we immediately knew that there is no, as we do in every crisis, but there is no human resource like God's people, the local church in every community, knowing and can serve in that community and that and that crisis like the church. You, you say that the church in Ukraine prior to the war uh, had experienced a major re revival across uh, the traditions. <clears throat> it, it touched all of the traditions. You know, I would, when, when we look at that, you know, of course, the, you know, the Coptic church in its history I, I don't, I'm not as familiar, you know, my, my probably deeper relationships has been, um, you know, with the more evangelical uh, Christianity, but, uh, you know, so the Coptic church, you know, is deep. And as you know, that's been even a conflict point, uh, I think, in the war, because they've been connected under the Patriarch Karel in, in, in Russia, uh, you know, and that was the conflict point uh, when the war began, they felt like they were connected to that and, and the Ukrainian leadership has wanted to have that separation. I do think, and we serve obviously everybody, when you have a crisis like this, it's God's people that want to serve people everywhere, including then the Coptic churches. I don't think that they had the maybe human resource or volunteer basis uh, in many times, but a lot of the priests served, you know, in many in, in many parishes as, as well. But um, so we served everybody. But I would say I'm probably more familiar with the with evangelical um, Protestant Christianity, but so, they have significant revival the last, you know, 30, 40 years. So uh, give us the profile of the average evangelical pastor in, in, in Ukraine. Are they a first generation believer, you know, the, the, multiple generations? Are they help, help us understand uh, who our brothers and sisters are there? I, I, I do think that you have I do think that you have a couple of uh, generations. You know, the church has been there for several. But, you know, the last 20, 30 years after Soviets, in fact, we used to have and this, I think, would be interesting in context. Uh, you know, and we had with us a host even this week and this very week. And Victor Pavlovsky, he is the, uh, the bishop of the uh, evangelical churches in uh, Moldova. You know, there are about 402 churches, I think he said. But he's also the president of the Slavic, the International Fellowship of Slavic Churches Worldwide, which is the old USSR churches. There are about 7,400 churches. And that includes the Russian churches, the Ukrainian, Moldovan, you know, all, and, and also the diaspora churches worldwide. So he's been leading this and he was just sharing even this weekend. I think this is interesting because he grew up and he got his first Bible when he was 20. His father was a believer, came to faith during Soviet Union. The church was obviously persecuted in all forms uh, during Soviet Union. So the most uh, revival, even including Ukraine, that we've seen is the, since 91 when freedom came. But the church was growing and he said he had this picture he shared of the first fathers from that group of the of the Slavic churches. And they were gathered in Moscow, 90, uh, 91. And that picture had most of the church leaders and they were counting how many years of prison they paid uh, to combine uh, that picture of fathers of faith during Soviet Union. It was about 600 years wow. uh, of combined prison time. You know, so that is uh, the shoulders. They stand on faith. Obviously, that was what it was to be a believer during Soviet. Uh, now, the freedom, when it came, I think the growth, the revival I'm referring to is the last 30 years. You've seen incredible growth. They were at that time, you know, a fraction of the numbers there now. And, and I think that's what we've seen. But Ukraine was certainly a catalyst. In fact, I would say, and he would say this, he said this this week, and a lot of the, and this is what makes it complex, a lot of the uh, leaders and church uh, pastors in Russia 
was a lot of Ukrainian leaders because it was part of the USSR and the revival was stronger in Ukraine. So they ended up moving to Russia, planting churches across Russia and 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 went to Bible school together, maybe in Kiev or some places. But today they're fully Russian and the conflict has separated them. But there were brothers, sisters that were together during Bible school, even called to ministry. And today the war separated them and it makes it very complex. Yeah, this is this is actually part of the phenomenon. I don't I don't think a lot of people understand um, and it also is the case with the Jewish community, by the way. There are about 200,000 Jews in Ukraine and about 200,000 Jews in Russia. Um, and so the whole, uh, on, on each side of this, you have people trying to survive in, vi- in various definitions of what survival means as these two, two, two nations are, are, are at war. But would you draw a direct link between the Soviet uh, persecution of Christians and the revival that came afterwards? I mean, are these stories part of that history? I, I, I certainly believe that because I think that's been our even global mission experience. I think that uh, you, when we are looking worldwide, uh, you know, persecuted churches bring out, I think, one a tenet in Christianity, which is the priesthood of every believer, hmm. meaning that you have to count the cost or pressure of a society, even the persecution. Obviously, we're not advocating. We're, you know, one of us coming from very free societies. But persecution seems to always put that pressure on the believer to decide what it means to live a Christian faith. Uh, and I believe that always is generated. And I think the pattern statistic data bears that, that, that links to uh, catalyze, catalyzing uh, somewhat of a renewal, revival and growth. And for sure, I, I believe that's the case in Ukraine. How, how, how are the Christians in Ukraine responding in terms of their faith to this uh, brutal war and the killing. I'm sure many, many people who have died are Christians uh, and their homes destroyed. How, how, how are they grappling with the suffering this war has caused? Mm, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. I, in the, the first trips we made, um, you know, I felt like it was a nationalism and doubling down, you know, in the culture, a very strong resolve that they were defending not just you know faith and serving people they were also uh feeling like they were defending their country in a very strong strong way uh that i felt the last trip um in some ways you know there's a fatigue uh, we had a meeting recently we were in kiev and we opened up a family center so we bought a building in bulcha which is um um you know where the mass graves in fact it's very close to the mass graves in that early conflict when they surrounded kiev and that family center is designed to help you know, veterans, uh, wounded soldiers, but also widows and orphans. You don't have an orphan system uh, or a foster care system that we would have. So, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we decided we think the church could be also a really good uh, agent to serve across Ukraine in this. And this was the first model. And then at the bottom floor, we have a, it's called a champion club, but it's with special need children. It is also foster children. So we opened that and we were there. And then we had a a trauma care conference for pastors, bishops, and chaplains. And we were maybe, there were maybe about 400 delegates from across the country um, that we had this initial conference. But the, the, the fatigue, I felt like you're sensing, and the sense of national trauma that now almost two years into it is uh, settling in, I, it was startling. And I, I think I never seen so many wounded men too. I think that there, there is a trauma that is just heart um, heart wrenching and i i could sense you know when we're teaching you know people are broken pastors are broken they're on the front line serving and they're still in a state of shock you know the bishop pastor in in curson uh, that was an honor occupation his son was personally uh, kidnapped taken to primaria tortured for three months trying to sway his father being a bishop because they see him as a man of influence and culture changer so the they were using his son as a pawn to influence his father uh, to choose side to side actually with uh, with the other side so i'm i i i i think it's hard sometimes to fully understand what they're battling with every day and i sense that fatigue that trauma is just becoming real so um, you know certainly we got to pray for them but i also think we got to the christian community worldwide also start reaching into the co- people here in the conflict zone how do we you know, they're every night under bombardment, uh, you know, and those sirens goes off every night. You live with that trauma every day. Um, and I think that's becoming a reality that uh, we we got to serve into. Take, go ahead, Johnny. Uh, um, take us to the beginning, Carl. Uh, the war starts. 
um, City Serve and all of your network of of churches. I mean, you respond uh, immediately. Um, what did you do? How did you do it? You know, t- give us give us a sense of 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 how the church has has been engaged in the conflict from the very very beginning. Excellent. Yeah. So for our our response, our network was a. Uh, uh, a, a network of uh, evangelical churches across Europe. It's called a European network. There about plus twenty thousand churches in Europe. So we we had our friends, and that's kind of our city serve Europe team. So me and um, Dave Dons and, and Wendell, you know, the co founders also of City Serve. Uh, we 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 got on the plane right away, and we knew Poland received as as you remember immediately the the, the most uh, refugees. And you know, you think about you think about. Uh, the avalanche of refugees at, at the you know the, the, the immediate coming. So we flew right away to Poland and start working kind of there with the churches. Uh, they had set up, and our leadership there had good friends who were able to go right right away to the border. Uh, what was amazing is that the churches in diaspora, meaning that you had the Ukrainian churches even in Warsaw integrated to the other networks of churches, they almost instantly responded, uh, setting up networks, and we were able to use really leveraging. What the church was always doing, and I think this is this beautiful picture of always uh, in crisis. The church responds, uh, even not without re- you know, even before they have resources, they just respond with what they have. Open up their churches, congregations, pews, sleep in our buildings, our homes, share the food they have, whatever that was. So it was easy for us to come alongside, and I think it's beautiful this picture of the body of Christ. When one part hurts, we get to rally around that. Uh, as brothers and sisters worldwide and add to it. And that's really City Service model too. How do we help the church that respond? Uh, because they will do that with what they have regardless. So the supply chain it very quickly took shape and we're able to kind of bring some expertise to it, enhance it. Uh, and then we started immediately uh, resourcing a fleet of vehicles. At that time, uh, you know, women and children were fleeing the front line where uh, the conflict zone where they were bombing. Um, so we brought food in and women and children out. And that was probably the first three month, four month and try to bring them out to the border. But, you know, it was uh, then it was to absorb it into Europe um, that became the challenge of the church supporting the church network across Poland, Moldova. He was just saying, uh, Victor, Bishop Victor Pavlovsky, that was just with us from Moldova. You know, here's a country of two and a half million. And, and and he was just with the uh, prime minister. You know, they're doing incredible work, but they were estimating in the beginning the country of Moldova maybe could absorb 100,000 refugees. They end up receiving, <clears throat> they end up yeah. receiving over a million refugees, wow. large part of the churches. Think about it. Every third person you would see in Moldova was a refugee. Wow. That kind of paints this picture of this dramatic influx of people and the church responding in real time. And I think... Uh, that is the story we will hear about. And, and with the Syrian uh, conflict t- taking place earlier, you know, in this twenty uh, first century that we're in, and now the Ukrainian um, uh, the war uh, with Ukraine against Ukraine, um, the European Church is coping with an enormous amount of of refugees from within Europe, from outside of Europe. I mean, how do you how do you think about that as a as a as a pastor who, uh, I mean, you went uh, from uh, from Sweden uh, to Africa um, uh, uh, to serve uh, with your ministry, and then we're, we're looking at a Europe where the where there's so much movement inside of it and everything around it. How do, how do Christians uh, how do Christians think about this? Uh, you know, uh, I, I think that um, that is uh, also a great question. Do, do, in Europe, you know, you would have like anywhere, you know, political debate that maybe deals more with immigration. But, you know, what we talk about from the church perspective is integration. The church can always serve in the integration part. And I was actually very much part of, uh, we, I returned to Europe and helped a lot of the European churches 2015, 16 with the Syrian crisis. In fact, it was more than Syrian. Afghans, uh, Sweden, uh, Norway, uh, Finland, the Scandinavian countries received more Afghans than Syrians, really. Uh, but, you know, our argument was at the time that it, absolutely massive number in Sweden uh, received per capita in Germany, I think most, uh, but mostly Sweden took uh, Afghan boys. There was a lot of young boys, but the Afghan population, you know, here is people that uh, a lot of the church has been praying for for decades. Or, and this has been the mission field that we've been sending to 
they're all knock, knocking on the doors. And what they were looking for is opportunity uh, and, and, and a job and integration, learning language opportunities. And I would say that it did not just uh, minister. The churches responded, I think, in a beautiful way at that time. But it, become, it became also a revitalization of the churches. Because, you know, a lot of churches are stagnating in Europe. And suddenly here, the mission field was knocking on their doors. And they got to serve, created uh, language schools and coffee shops. But it really became a new life line, I think, for the churches. So for the churches, I think it's been overall incredibly powerful. In fact, we were saying that in Sweden alone, they baptized more Afghans to Jesus than almost all mission combined the last decade in Afghanistan, saying, illustrating maybe this big, broad idea uh, that, you know, uh, people running for their life, you know, uh, sometimes find hope. And when they find hope and, and, and service, they find also, uh, you know, maybe a new life. So we thought that that was uh, beautiful. Now, that doesn't mean the challenge is not dramatic. So when you take that crisis, which was about five, six million, and now you had almost 8 million from Ukraine moving in, you know, over not five years, but uh, over six months. It was very dramatic. And I don't think that that has settled yet. But a lot of people returned to Ukraine. And I think the Ukrainian people has, since the uh, Soviet time, maybe more diaspora settlements. So it, I think that that was maybe a little bit more um, or maybe less dramatic, more organized because they already had diaspora communities that I think that uh, integrated a little bit different. Um, but I would say that the church still has uh, championed this. I do think the European society is looking at it a little bit different, um, you know, and I think that that's going to be troubling going forward. And I'm, I'm, I think we got to obviously uh, pray through how, how the church responds to that. But I, but that's why we use the language. It's about integration, not immigration. And the church can always receive that stranger knocking on your door. And that's what we should do. That's and, my and, and what would you say are the number of Ukrainians that have left the country and are still out who have not come back? I, I still think that that's a large number. So the official numbers was that, you know, it was 16 million displaced, 8 million, uh, almost 8.8, 8, I think was the official, you know, that moved. They think that almost half of them have returned to Ukraine or to some degree. So I think that we might have four or five million in diaspora still across Europe refugees. Uh, but the numbers is a little bit fluid. It was a real return to Ukraine uh, that that was surprising to many. Um, doubling down, but uh, you know, it's it's. Uh, but they're rebuilding the country, which was I think uh, uh, a surprise. A surprise, but still, there's a large number across Europe. Yeah, and in the return, was it uh, the men that returned, or families, women too? Uh, women too, and 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 this this is why I think you, you it was such a it was such a movement quickly, and people were fleeing. But as you remember, a lot of people, they were not able to take elderly, for example. So you had elderly people remaining in Ukraine and no one cares for them now. So they return maybe to care for their mom and dad, for their grandfather, grandmother. So you had you had social obligations, I think, that was part of it, women and children. Uh, men, in many ways, didn't want to return because then they're drafted. So I didn't hear everyone wanting to return to fight. Uh, you know, now you, you have a political conversation from Ukraine that is forcing almost or wanting to force extradition because they're running out of, I think, uh, in the draft, people fighting. So there's a, there's a little bit of a dynamic there that's that's funny. But uh, I think that the main reason was caring for people remaining. So what you started to find, and we found this uh, testimonies from pastors from the conflict zone, uh, after maybe three to six months, bringing women and children out from the front line, they came and said, hey, we need to help you. They're shelling every night. You need to leave. And they said, no, we will not. We'd rather stay in our basement because I'm caring for my grandmother, my mother, and my father. So there's so many dynamics uh, to that, um, uh, that that makes it difficult to flee, I think. And that's maybe the main cause of return. It, it reminds me of um, I was involved in helping people in Iraq and Syria uh, in 2014, 2015. And there was this big debate um, about the Christian presence in the Middle East and, and people, should they stay? Should they go? Should they? And there are all kinds of debates happening in Europe and the United States about immigration and all of these things. And my premise was always um, for the victims of war or for terrorism, uh, they have to make their own decisions. And I, I can't make the decisions for them. It's, it's none of my business. I, I, I don't know what I would do if I were in those situations. 
Um, and it's for government officials to set policies. And sure, when I vote, you know, that's my opportunity to be involved in that process. But but it's the job of government to set policies. But whatever policies are set and whatever decisions that those individual victims make, it's the Christian's job to serve. And and I, I think the European church, you know, <laughs> every, I love the uh, um, uh, the. You know this um, this premise that this uh, secularizing European uh, church um, is actually um, being resuscitated uh, in many ways, uh, but but not just through a spiritual revival, um, through the gospel with a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus, and instead of going out to people, the people are literally knocking on the door for help, and yeah. I think that's a really really incredible thing, Bishop. You, I mean, in India. Uh, I've seen this with you, um, the way your communities, they are the frontline responses. I mean, the medical clinics, you know, all these incredible things that are taking place. Like the church is everywhere. The church is where the people are. Yeah. And when they're suffering, that's where we should be. And that's that's the legacy of of, of the traditions that we all come from. And uh, and the fact that the Ukrainian church is doing it, and then the Europeans are coming around, and other churches are coming coming around, is a uh, is a is a great testimony. Uh, Carl, uh, you know I'm I'm uh, I'm involved in ecumenical efforts all around the place. One of my heartbreaks with this whole thing was the break of relationship between the Russian Orthodox and the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Mm. How deep do you think now the pain and hurt on both sides is on this? And are there, maybe not at the top, maybe not at you know, the patriarch level, but are there leaders in the middle, in the lower level, who who would like some reconciliation between these two sectors of the church? Well, that's a, also a great uh, question, Bishop. I, we, we've been encouraging, obviously, because we've been involved like you. You know, reconciliation is eventually part of also what the church can be involved in. You know, uh, so the, there is conversations, and and they've been they're very difficult. And they've been saying maybe you know we're, we're, we we know we have to have communications, but the complexity of it, you know, as I was sharing here, is maybe some of the leaders. They were together, as you know, the Orthodox Church. They are. They were fully under the Patriarch Kirill, meaning they were part of the Russian Orthodox Church. That separation is just recent. Um, that's true also with the Protestant and the evangelicals we work with. They, they came maybe from the same Bible schools, called into train together, brothers. You know, pre-conflict. So, there is a brotherhood that now, you know, uh, they were illustrating one interesting thing, uh, and I and I think it illustrates how challenging it is. So they were. They were saying, um, you know, some brothers here, you know, you have a, now you have a conflict zone. So the people in the conflict zone, they're obviously Ukrainian citizens, but they maybe were, um, you know, they're Russian speaking. They came out of Russian culture. So right now, um, because they're occupied by Russia, you know, they can't get help from the Ukrainian leaders or Ukrainian churches. They're under occupation from Russia. So they've been crying out for help to the Russian churches. There were also their brothers on that side. And and by them responding, there is even increased in uh, you know the the conflict between brothers. Meaning that now you're endorsing a side that shouldn't be endorsed. Meaning by your serving. So there are so many complexities to <clears throat> to the to it, I think the dynamics of it. But the end is, and, and I, I I felt like in this conversations they're meeting discussing this and how they as the body of Christ, God's people, respond to the Christ. Christ is serving serving the people uh, and try to be above the politic even the conflict how is God's church respond to this beyond that obviously there's going to be language and conversations but I do think that the church should be in the middle of whatever reconciliation should happen that's what Jesus people should be doing it, you know it's interesting that um, in one of my uh, uh, one of my books the new book of Christian martyrs um, I tell the story of Alexander men. Um, who was a famous uh, Russian Orthodox martyr who was best friends with Billy Graham. And, you know, a lot of the um, a lot of the legacy of Billy Graham and the former Soviet Union um, was was directly linked to this uh, this uh, courageous 
um, you know, leader in the Russian Orthodox Church who was martyred right before um, that the the end of the end of the Soviet Union, and and uh, and you know, he was martyred in a um, uh, um, you know not in a public square. He was mysteriously killed. Um, yes. And so, you know, I, I think sometimes people miss that the the evangelical community and the Orthodox communities, you know, uh, have uh, they've had a long relationship, particularly in times of in times of, of persecution. And and you do wonder um, when all of this is said and done, please God, um, that if there's a, if there's a way that evangelicals will be a part of um, of, of helping helping in all of this. I, I have one um, and one last question uh, myself. Maybe the bishop has one as well. But uh, you've encountered so many incredible um, people and stories, and some of them heartbreaking, some of them inspirational. Uh, I'm wondering if there's a story or two uh, that just sticks with you uh, from the last uh, last couple of years. Uh, yeah, let me. Um, it is, and I, I think that it, it is both on the victory and the prayer of the church. You will hear. You know, when we serve together, and I think it's a testimony to, you know, we all end up, including the Re- Jewish Relief Network, we, when it was crisis, we served everybody and food, the food distribution network included everybody of faith. Um, but, you know, that resolve also for freedom, it was a, the bishop I mentioned that had his son uh, captured, you know, he was in Kherson when there was occupied, uh, you know, and, and the Russians held the city of Kherson in that region for some time. And his son was taken you know, they swept the streets and they used then children to kind of persuade political or influencers, if you will. So his son was, and he's 14 years old, his son. So, mm. it, uh, you know, uh, being tortured um, and and uh, it's a pretty dramatic story. So his father is there and being pressured uh, to cave to political pressure. Obviously, that was the design. And they're praying. They're interceding for freedom of his son, freedom of their city and freedom of their country. And just prior to uh, a gathering of the church leaders we had in Warsaw, uh, uh, you know, he was saying, we've been praying for victory and we know deliverance will come. And and then um, as they were praying, all of a sudden, working every back channel, every door, uh, supernaturally, miraculously, a friendly person in Crimea uh, deciding to release their son, 14 years old. Wow. So his son comes released. You know, and, and obviously it's very traumatized. And we even providing care for him. And I got to see him shortly after in Warsaw. But his son is released. And then shortly a week after, the city of Kherson, unexplainably, the people, the the army, R- Russian army is just leaving the city of Kherson, mar- deciding to march out. And by all uh, definitions, they felt like it was supernatural. They didn't know why they left. They used to end up uh, abandoning the city. So he was coming to us with his son and again we provided trauma care and the the the, the son has gone through tremendous um difficult things but uh here the bishop was saying we've been praying for miracles and deliverance and here my son is delivered our city is delivered now we just believe for number three ukraine to be delivered so that was an incredible story of faith and resolve that i think is the whole city of the whole people the nation of ukraine holds uh, that's what they believe for um, deliverance and and, 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 we, uh, and we join them and join you in that prayer mm-hmm. you know war is evil and and people need to be delivered from violence yes. and suffering and hatred yes. and killing yeah amen uh, Carl you you are exactly the type of person that we envisioned and having these conversations bridging the west and the east the whole body of Christ all, all around the world and uh, you you've you've, uh, you've called us to pray and to work on behalf of these people and you've given us hope um, and uh, and a little bit of empathy while we could never have empathy for this type of evil that these people have yeah. experienced um, uh, this has been a, been a delight thanks for having uh, th- thanks for taking the time to be with us Carl thank you yeah. you know at one level you see the images you see war you follow the story etc and those are facts and you're responding wondering what on earth is going on but having Carl here puts flesh and blood to what actually has been going on and uh, your, your heart is you know concerned for all of the Christians both on the Ukrainian side and the Christian and the Russian side all of whom were suffering uh, because of it and 
and thank God for for those who have reached out and trying to do what they can to help these uh, afflicted brethren. Yeah, Bishop, I, I sort of have uh, two two observations for that amazing, amazing conversation. And the first one is, um, once again, the church is everywhere. <laughs> it's like wherever there's a need, wherever there's a crisis, wherever someone needs something, uh, God has his people there. Yeah. And, and uh, it's the greatest humanitarian distribution system. It is uh, uh, lights of prayer. It is uh, people with a moral compass. It's this amazing. They serve first. They step up to the plate. I saw it in the Syrian crisis. I saw it in Iraq. I've seen it in North Africa. I've seen it everywhere. And now we're now we're seeing it seeing it in Europe. And then the second thing is just sort of a, a concern that I have, Bishop. Like people's opinions change over time, and I'm and I'm watching people uh, as we hear about the exhaustion of the church and of people in Ukraine. Um, where I live in the United States, people are becoming exhausted with um, with this war and, you know, for all kinds of political reasons and all of these things. And I think Christians um, must, we must do our part to um, to not lose the passion for the people that are that are caught in the middle of this of this conflict. Like. Whatever the politics of war are and whatever the ultimate thing, you know, outcome of this war is, and, you know, and it's very, very, very clear in this war who's the aggressor. But whatever the outcome, we cannot let, as Christians, we cannot be persuaded by politics to care one ounce less about these people. We yeah. have to do more. And, and, and we, cannot, we, cannot be, we cannot exhaust our love for them. Uh, and and cannot come and say, oh, uh, I, I can't do more. No, our love has to go to the extent that Christ's love went, went for us to the extreme, and and reach out to to people, whatever faith they are in. And you know, and, and the good thing is they fed people across. You know, the Jews and uh, Ukrainians, the Christians, and whoever, uh, the Muslims. They they fed everybody. And uh, yes, and, and politicians can decide, oh, we may give this money or not. But the church does not have that option That's right. in a crisis. And when they're informed, uh, they have to continue doing it till, as they are praying and we pray, deliverance comes. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you, you know, doesn't look like a, a weak, dying, secular church in Europe to me. <laughs> it looks like a thriving, growing, a spiritual revival, a serving church. I, I, what, a, what an inspirational conversation. Thank you for joining us today for Babel Undone. If this conversation had you thinking, then why don't you share it with someone else? For more episodes of Babel Undone or other amazing content that helps Christians live out their faith, you should head over to premiere.plus. That's premiere, P-R-E-M-I-E-R, for the Americans listening in, dot plus.